Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Going to be taking a look at an incredible uh, Robert Crumb interview today from 2022. But first, got to let you guys know that the videos are brought to you in a number of ways. Uh, we do have a Patreon uh, out there, and our biggest supporters get all these videos uh, before anybody else. And they are watching us record these videos live uh, through a private stream. Uh, you can uh, support the channel by checking out our books. Right before you is a bibliography of a bunch of stuff that we have out on the stands right now. And uh, forthcoming, there is going to be in 2023 a Hip Hop Family Tree omnibus collecting four volumes of Hip Hop Family Tree plus 140 pages of new material. That's more than a whole volume's worth of extras going to be packed into there. Uh, there is three volumes X-Men Grand Design, two volumes of Red Room, and uh, he, here are the covers for the next Red Room comics that are going to be solicited uh, for May. There's cover for issue number one. It's going to have a sketch cover variant that you can uh, order. Uh, this is Jimmy's variant cover for issue number one, and this is the cover for issue two. Big year 2023 for the King K Favors. Jimmy's going to have Street Angel, Princess of Poverty. It's a companion piece to Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive. And when you have both, you have all of the Street Angel comics that have ever been published to date. He has Hulk Grand Design out on the stands right now. Uh, support that Treasury Edition comic and get it before it disappears. You're going to regret it if you miss it. Three volumes X-Men Grand Designer out there and WYSIWYG. Now, before us, we have the la last provocateur. Even from his refuge in France, the comics artist R. Crumb still makes America's pulse race. We're covering this interview because first off we didn't know it existed until two people have sent us these magazines uh, over a period of time. Uh, Scott Strong, the guy who has sent us this amazing Barry Windsor Smith material, hooked us up with the magazine the first go round. This is the uh, New York Times style uh, magazine uh, for the date of September 18th of 2022. And then we recently got another copy of this in the P.O. box. So when you get two of these things that bears some investigation for sure. And uh, interviews like this, I like to read a good R. Crumb interview uh, every couple of years and, and see where the hell he's at in his life and his career. It'd be interesting to, um, to, to do a few of these over the decades to see, because like his position does change quite a lot. You know, at this point, like he's now represented by one of the biggest art galleries in the world. You know, um, I forget who it was recently. I heard them say like he might be the greatest living artist. You know, like that status is different than it would have been 20 years ago, 40 years ago, even though he's very successful at each of those steps. Yeah. But the way the world sees him changes. Totally. So it's nice to see like a, uh, a, a, a I, I consider this current, you know, like 2022. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's just a couple months ago. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting to see that snapshot of him at this point. Do you have the Crum uh, TCJ book uh, no, collection of interviews? Like I, I have it over there, man, but I probably have the scans or something. Could get those access to those interviews. And yeah, it would be good to go, go through a sample of these things. Uh, off the bat, dude, in paragraph one, they talk about the comic that we just looked at on the channel, A Short History of America, the 12 panels yes. showing uh, the the sort of evolution of a little plot of land. You know, one of the things uh, that, that we sort of left out when we were looking at that comic was that thing was a house, and then in about six panels, it just becomes like a little delicatessen. Like, you can't even live there anymore. It's now a big part of the city. Imminent domain might have been a thing, or some rich developer bought, bought it. But, uh, you know, that, that house, the evolution of just the house, is, is uh, there's a heartbreaking uh, component to that piece, man. Yeah, I just saw recently uh, all the clickbaits, everything that comes across, and I saw one, and it was about like the last mansion in, in Manhattan being sold or whatever, uh, or last private mansion or something along those lines where it's like surrounded by these gigantic commercial buildings, and you have a residency in between them. Uh, this is a fairly broad overview of uh, Robert Crumb. Um, the writer, M.H. Miller, uh, definitely leans into verbiage from the documentary from the early 90s kind of a lot which mm. which to me is a little bit unfortunate because i don't care about quotes from 30 years ago like let's let's talk about today and uh on <laughs> on crumb's uh, book bookshelf you know his to read pile because our fathers lied ufos and nukes gray aliens and the harvesting of souls uh, this reminds me, like, got a uh, dinner at SPX, uh, and uh, Gary Panter was there, and was talking about, like, his alien theories and things, 
and was talking about either talking to Crumb about such things or <laughs> like Crumb was brought up and, and like these dudes, they, they, they love that fringe, you know, stuff. You know what? I do too. And, and I often think about it because he's like, I'm very interested in fringe things like that. But at this point, aliens are, pick your news source. They're on every channel. They're on every, you know, whatever homepage you go to. Uh, I feel like aliens have become mainstreamed. But that fringe thing was so cool because comics were fringe. Yeah. Especially comics that weren't aimed at selling Spider-Man underwear or whatever to kids. Like, it was fringe, an adult comic. It's, and so, like, they kind of sat on the shelves easily next to each other. Interesting art, interesting writing. Like, all that stuff would exist in the fringe outside of whatever commercial concerns were sort of governing the editorialization of it. Think about... Uh, think about... Um Ides is heyday, the big comic shop uh, here in Pittsburgh, uh, there would be the literature section, and it was all subversive literature. Yes. Like, there would be whole books on the occult. Like, that's where you could buy your anarchist cookbooks, hydroponics, how to, how to grow, you know, marijuana in weird conditions. Those books from, you know, Feral House and right. Loom Panics and uh, Paladin Press. Like, all those goofy books that you know, could set you up to be a survivalist and mm -hmm. certainly will be putting you, you don't want to buy those books uh, with a credit card. <laughs> yeah, you get some of that paranoia later on in this in this interview too, where they talk about Crumb not having a cell phone and also like uh, being concerned about his emails because they all go to NSA. <laughs> and, it, and it does. I mean, that, that's been proven. Uh, there, there, there is a thing called chatter though, which uh, yes, they collect it all, but they don't have enough people to listen to it all. So you better not say uh, the wrong stuff. Um, it's kind of wild to think this is where Crumb's head is at, though. You know, I mean, I guess in some ways it's the popular story of, of, of our world today, AI and all of these things. And it seems like, yeah, Crumb is, is uh, interested in that stuff as well. You know, I think about um, the, the time that these people grew up in with with Richard Nixon you being a young adult when Richard Nixon happens and you could take a look at uh the all the popular um uh presidential approval rating like you could see throughout the history of America since they started doing the approval stuff up until Nixon it was almost 50-50 like like uh like no 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 sorry about that it was almost 100% of people were like yeah this is our president like we got to get get behind him uh, Nixon fucks it all up right. and creates that space for amazing paranoia because, because now you've got shenanigans happening that is demonstrable. Uh, you got examples of, yeah, we will hurt our own. You got Kent State happening when these people are young running around and stuff. Like the stuff that they lived through and saw... It breeds its own version of paranoia and the same as, like, you know, his parents probably had, like, from the Depression and, and you know, squirreling money away in, behind bookshelves and things like that. Like, it's real interesting thinking about it in those terms. Uh, yeah, they, they even kind of touch on that. Um, Eileen uh, Crumb's wife is still alive at the point in this interview. So, they, you know, she contributes and they talk, too. And she says, like, they moved to France in the 80s and uh, that it was not a good decade in the United States. It was like now, but not quite as bad. I feel like whenever you check in, like when you're born, when you become conscious of media around you, you can keep going back in history and find these parallels like you're just describing. Like all of the stuff that we are dealing with today, it didn't start this decade no, or course. last decade or the one before that. When I when I started getting underground comics, I would always be like, oh shit, this underground comic from 1968, same stuff that they're talking about in there is what we're talking about today. Like it's so never ending the cyclical nature of these things. So one of the uh, last straws, man, uh, that inspired them to get the hell away was when uh, Reagan starts to cut educational funding. Yeah. And at Sophie's school, there's no longer music or art classes. And imagine that, have two artistic parents who know the power and importance of, of art and they're musicians. And, and now your, your daughter doesn't have access to that. And listen, man, I just became, became a, uh, owner some real estate and paid school tax. Like if that money don't go to stuff that I wanted to go to, like yes. as a parent, I could see myself being real angry about that sort of thing. How about this though? For a little bit, Crumb volunteered and taught drawing at that school. Imagine if you were a kid that had Crumb as your drawing teacher. Yeah. What a what a memory! I want to hear from those people, man. What do they remember from that? Imagine if that is even possible now. Like for for Crumb to do, he can't he can't go to a damn. College course. Phoebe Glockner is quoted in here, man, because she's teaching. She was teaching a course, 
She'd been a teacher in academia. We're talking higher education. We're talking 18 or older. And some little clowns are like crying about uh, that that it, it got Chrome got slid into the curriculum and it like you know whatever the new Gen Z buzzwords are for being offended at that kind of thing. And even Glockner, see, this is a very holistic interview. It's great, man, because you need some POV, right? And it's great that Linda Berry and Phoebe Glockner are, are here to just sort of bolster, bolster the uh, the the work and achievements of the guy. He said that you know that at the end of that little time teaching, like the local preacher was driving students out of his class by saying, "Crumb agent of the devil." Yeah. <laughs> so like that's you know way pre social media. Like that's a person, a it's local always, yeah. person, like bringing that after you. Yeah, and Ugh. he's always dealt with it, man. Like like, and that's where they get the quotes from the lady from Mother Jones magazine that are straight from the Crumb documentary. You know, in that documentary, Trina Robbins is is you know kibitzing about you know Crumb's portrayal of women and this and that. Here's here's something, man. I actually went on the website and you got to actually contact the gallery for the price of this comic. So uh, it, it might not be easy to get your hands on this. The Crumb Family COVID Expose, uh, drawn by Aileen Robert and I think Sophie. Yeah, I believe ha- so. has some pieces, even though her name isn't mentioned on there, but. Uh, you go on the website and I don't see even a page count or something. So, so it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel right to me. I need to see more information cause I'm not going to like pay $200 for an eight page comic or, or something like that. But, uh, he's at that level now, man, where like, that's, that's how these comics are disseminated. They talk about it in, in, in here and I'm like, I want to see that. Where was that comic? Who published that comic? I remember it made some noise. I thought this tidbit, um, I didn't know this. George Lucas bought the Book of Genesis artwork. That's fascinating because... 2.9 million. The rumor was that it was um, Steve Wozniak. That's that's the name that I heard uh, time and time again. But right here in print, man, it's, it's George Lucas, who is another bearded, portly fella. <laughs> it's worth noting, too, like even the, uh, the writer of this article says, at least according to a two, 2017 comic. So, you know, maybe maybe that's not where it ended up or maybe it's changed hands since then. Who knows? Leo owns a couple. Talks about those sketchbooks. You know, the famous story from that, that we always hear is trading uh, sketchbooks for that place in France. And it says here he sells those notebooks for uh, about a about million dollars each. If you yeah. want a crumb notebook at home. Yeah, yeah. He's just saved his his notebooks. It's so stuff. funny, too, to see, like, name dropping, like, Leonardo DiCaprio, you know, and his uh, his father, who was connected to Underground Comics. They get get a name drop because why not, man? It's, it's a New York Times magazine. Let's get some some big names in here. You mentioned it, uh, represented by the uh, David uh, Zwerner Gallery. Get some quotes from from the gallery owner. And, you know, it it talks about it, and we know this, people either love it or they hate it. And I feel like that's really, like, you have to have that to be a certain level of success. You do. It almost feeds the, the, it fuels the fire for success. Because it keeps it keeps your name relevant. It keeps people talking. It's exactly what you were saying a minute ago about politics. You know, like the political situation Absolutely. is 50. It's got to be 50.1 versus 49.9 because otherwise, if it's majority's happy with this or that, there's no story. There's That's no true. clickbait. His iconography includes every taboo imaginable. What a summary. Jeez. They talked about, like, it's not in this interview, but Crumb Crum mentioned it. Uh, in it might have been comic book confidential where like they they created this opportunity and the job for the first couple of years was to just like take things literally as far as they could possibly push it down to incest stories and things like that and then you kind of dial it back and i feel like that that makes so much sense man we're like we're like in a medium that really got infantilized for 15 years up to that point with the comics code and the chilling effect of the comics code and, and, uh, you know, the pl- placidity of, of mainstream Marvel DC. And then the other big comics are, you know, little Lulu and Donald duck and things like that. I feel like art history works that way. You know, it's cubism or abstract expressionism and all those different kinds of, uh, movements that happen. The underground movement is like an exercise in like, let us sh- let us show you just fucking how far you could push it. And then you got your Hernandez brothers and your Klaus. And the, the, to like pick up the pieces and 
and make something more rich. I, I use this analogy all the time, but I always think of it as like, it's it's a frontier. It's, it's yeah. like you're mapping this stuff out and those underground comics definitely were like pushing that frontier. And yeah. then you can fill in. You know, like, like the, the, the alternative car cartoonists of the 80s can then come in and explore all that area behind them that's like, this is all new area. Right. Let me stake my homestead here. Yeah. They, you know, they talk about it all, man. Uh, you know, the racist portrayals of, of black people is certainly... Uh, something that's going to follow a crumb forever. Uh, I'm watching uh, collections of um, Mickey Mouse cartoons from from date with like the black and white shorts and things. And on these DVDs, they have Leonard Moulton on there, kind of giving some context and things. But before there will be something that's um, spicy, something divisive. Uh, Leonard Moulton will have like a little intro bit to kind of explain context at the time and things. Uh, and then and then you like launch into the the cartoon. So he tries to create uh, a state of mind, like not making zero excuses for for the material. But uh, I thought that was noteworthy. And 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 Moulton makes the makes the uh, argument like like should we put these works into a vault never to be seen? He's and he said you know it's absurd. You know like we we can learn this is stuff that we can learn from. It is art from a period of time. You know, same applies here. Yeah, here we get into uh, Alison Bechtel and Linda Berry talking about Crumb. Um, man, I hate to use the word defender, but it's literally the word that, that Miller's using in the text. But you see those cartoonists of that caliber weighing in in a positive way. And, right. and I feel like, yeah, I'll defer to them. <laughs> I'm happy to, to uh, value both of their opinions. It, it, I bet if you're the writer of an article like this, it is fun because you do get to pull out both sides of this argument, and just highlight like a who's who on either side. Yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, you know, this is not the kind of uh, article that's just, you know, done, done, done in a weekend or something. Like this guy put in work. He talked about half dozen to two ten uh, sources, you know, down to Zweigoff and, uh, you know, and others to uh, put this piece together. Might have, might have taken this poor bastard the summer to, to write it. Yeah, yeah, and probably was uh, some fun conversations that, that don't make it in here from talking to these various people. I love this quote from Linda Berry. Uh, she says that what R. Crumb gave her was this feeling that you could draw anything. Right. And that's amazing. And when I think of Linda Berry, like, I feel like she's given that to so many people through her work. So it's kind of cool to see her identify that in another artist. Yeah, totally. Uh, Phoebe Glockner talking about showing her, show, showing the comics in uh, in her coursework at the, the university that she teaches at, you know, has taught after it for 18 years and, and the sort of pushback and uh, the defense that she had to enact to just, you know, with administration even. Unbelievable. Phoebe Glockner's one of those people, like, I got that Dangerous Drawings book. For yeah. anybody unfamiliar with it, it's a collection of maybe 15 cartoonists from late 90s. Klaus, Chester Brown, Chris Ware, Phoebe Glockner. That's when I first came across all these artists and really like added them to my reading list. We need to look at some of her work. Oh, she's she was one of my just favorites. in that um, Raw and Weirdo art show, and I just got the catalog, and there's some beautiful Phoebe Glockner work in there. Her background is a medical illustrator. I know we're going off on a tangent here, but she is so good as an illustrator. Oh, incredible. Incredible. It was, it was her stuff that I gravitated most when she came to, when that, that show came to. Uh... Carnegie Mellon. Yes. Like she had some, some amazing pieces in there, uh, for sure. Um, but you know, they're, they're also talking about that stuff that you, you hear the, like the very sort of emotionally charged people on your Twitters and, and online, your social medias, where there's this thing where people think that like, because you put something into the work, then you are the thing. Like I see people even who uh, you know, have a Nazi in their story who is the villain, who um, people make the argument online that you now create a platform for Nazis. Like, like you're basically Streisand affecting Nazism by talking about it right. and, and putting it out there. It is, it is a fascinating, perfect time period to, uh, to interview Robert Crumb uh, for this kind of thing because, uh, you know, off-camera... Away from you know things on the record, almost a hundred percent of the people that we interact with uh, are like the polls are going crazy, man. The left is out of control. The right is out of control. Like we need some like stability, you know, like within the 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 middle piece. But nobody's 
uh, willing to talk about that stuff publicly because you just don't want the piranhas to come chewing up your 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 body and then leaving you a little husk and before they find the next thing to be offended by or or want to uh, tear down. Uh, so this is a uh, you know a perfect uh, article, a perfect interview to have. So they, they start on sort of his backstory and the ingredients that they lay out, and a lot of this is in the Crumb documentary, but it's, um, you know, a lot of Catholic school upbringing. It's a 20-year Marine veteran father, uh, abusive. You know, like it really lays out, like, here are the ingredients of yeah. how someone, and it's not quite that simple, but you can, boy, this was hardwired into Crumb at an early age, yeah, I guess totally. is what I'm saying. Yeah, totally, totally. And, and, and like, just... I am not comparing myself uh, to, to Chrome, but like the, you know, super tough pops and stuff. And the little bit of positive feedback I got as a youngin was like, I, I, I drew him, my pop sleeping just for practice. And he saw it and I was like, oh, that's good boy. Like I never heard him say anything nice. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm. I drew him in all my comics a bunch for the first bunch of years, and I feel like that might be so sort of connected. But uh, you know, if you feel if you feel small, if you feel like worthless, uh, you could either you know cause harm to yourself, or you can uh, do your best to be productive and try to find your way in the world, try to get out of the situation. Talks about comics as therapy for him a kind of a therapy yeah and that's, and that's an interesting conversation to have because uh it's my it's my thought that like it's not the subject matter that's could be the therapeutic part you know, like you know you have some like very very dark subjects that people talk about and like the the process to make a comic is so time consuming that at what point does it become wallowing you know i, th I think about uh you know, even that Barry Windsor Smith Monsters book, right? Like, like to spend 40, 35 years on something with that kind of subject matter. Like, like, is that therapeutic? Are you exercising a demon or are you indulging in it or wallowing in it or something? Man, it's a, it's a, when it comes to comic, like I believe in art therapy, but the comics part of it and the amount of time it takes to make a thing Depending on the subject, the uh, mileage may vary, I feel like. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the reaction you get to Crumb's work, right? The people who are defending it in here are identifying it that way. Mm -hmm. This is something that he's working through, something he grew up with, something he's, you know, processing versus this is just exploitation. This is racism. This is sexism. And it, it's it's that way for all of this stuff. You know, like, I, I don't know that Barry Windsor Smith and Robert Crumb have the same motivation in their comics making. Right. Or, or how they're reacting to the comics that they make. Um, you know, Crumb in particular, I just think of how much volume he has created. Like, I picture him as, he's awake, he's drawing. Right. And that's a different thing than, like, okay, I'm working on my next graphic novel. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's interesting to hear him say it, though. Just because, like you say, we've, we've grown... If you make any kind of art... That idea of therapy comes up. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, whatever you, side you want to come down on, I, I, I do think it's fun to hear the actual artist talk about it a little bit. Somebody of, of, of Crumb's caliber. Do you have a point of view? I don't. I think it varies on the person. It might even vary on the project, you know, depending on what that subject is. And I think in some cases it may turn into therapy when it was not the original intent. You know, <laughs> you do come out in this stuff. You end up sleeping with it sure. and thinking of these ideas. So inevitably it's going to go through your subconscious unless it's something that's really just superficial commercial yeah. job. And, you know, how that is processed, I don't know. It can't hurt. Per personally, I I, th I think of it as a, uh, it's a, it's a meditative state. Yes. Like it's a total zen, like happy comfortable state like i'm i'm not like a uh torture artist mentality type person like it's when i feel my best and it's not the cliche of like i'm contr controlling everything here i'm literally chilling uh my head's in a good place i'm outside of myself a little bit man not internalizing anything negative time flies uh good music I'm a huge advocate for, like, make something. Yeah. Spend some time. You know, if it's a hobby that you're spending 15 minutes a night, you know, writing, drawing, whatever. Like, I'm, I'm an advocate for that kind of, some kind of creative outlet. So, is that therapy? I, I, I don't know. I think it's a healthy habit. Yeah. You know, so, whatever word you want to put on it, go for it. But I do think, like, just making things is a positive. You're adding to the world, you know? You're adding to kind of the experience that we all share here.
So it's like exercise or anything. I think it's a positive thing for your mental state. Yes. Uh, uh, rest in peace, Aileen Kaminsky Crumb. She is a part of this interview, and, and we 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 no longer have her. Uh, they call her a cancer survivor in here. Um, so unfortunately, we we just don't have her, and that's incredibly sad to me. Uh, but here on the channel, just organized a bunch of things in the studio. Uh, we're going to be looking at some of their comics, and he spent the bulk of the last big chunk of his comics making career, his output, doing jam pieces with her, jam comics and things. So we're going to put some of those under the microscope, uh, self-loathing comics, dirty laundry comics. I'm looking forward to that, because it's another one of those unusual uh, collaborations. Yeah. You know, when you think of comics, it's Stanley and Jack Kirby, but... It isn't always, right? You know, and this is a good example of some collaborative comics where you've got uh, writer artist, writer artist. Yeah, yeah, that that's real fun. And and she adds that quote: "No artist who's honest knows why he does something." And I think that sums up that whole idea of is it therapy? Is it something else? You know, one one thing I, I do take away from everything I've ever seen about Crumb is this idea: like, um, there's a line here: he's still willing to make himself ugly and un unlikable in his work. He's a character. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I've, I've never met him. Uh, even if I did, I don't know that I would know him. But Crumb is such a character, and it reminds me of somebody like a Stan Lee who, like, there's a public... There's a very crafted character here. Sure. And a lot of ways, everything I say about Crumb is based on that crafted character. Like, I see a very edited version of Crumb. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's unlikable at times. It's ugly. You know, it's all these things. But also, like, how much of it is character and how much of it is Crumb? Because I have heard from people that know him, that's not quite what you get. Even like Gary Groth in some of those interviews in the Comics Journal will kind of talk about him. Um, I can't remember if it was at the Dallas Fair. It might have been at an event in, in Seattle, uh, one of those art shows where a bunch of cartoonists were. And he's like pratfalling and fooling around <laughs> with Bo Bern Hogarth, you know, and stuff like that. And you see like there are these other sides of him. You know, I don't know that he's this guy that we see in his comics. You know, I think there's probably a lot more to him. But yeah. I love that idea that like we craft these these characters and then that's who we are. And and now that's the norm. Because everybody okay. has their their online aliases, you know, their their personas. Some, Used to just be Crumb and Stan Lee and now it's everybody. Yeah, some people that's all they have. That's because they certainly ain't making comics. True. With all those Twitter fingers, man, you good to go? Yes, I am. K Faber's like follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell so that we can notify you when new videos are available. Uh, hit up our Patreon. It is in the link in the description below, and depending on your level of support, you're seeing all these videos before anybody else, but the vids are brought to you by the books that we make. Jimmy, tell the people what's out there, man. Street Angel, Princess of Poverty, coming out later this spring. You can pre-order that now from Image Comics, and that will collect all of the comics that are not in Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive, which is also available now. Uh, the Plain Jane's My Young Adult graphic novel and Hulk Grand Design, both are out and available and you can join me on patreon.com slash jimrug to see more of my comics and art, to see what I'm working on next, and to download out-of-print zines and mini-comics. The Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus is coming out in 2023. It's the best book I ever made, and it has 140 pages of art and extras that is not in the original four volumes. Scoop that thing up, man. Go to my link tree. Put in your pre-orders today. I'm also soliciting the next round of Red Room comics, uh, Crypto Killers 1 is being offered to your store right at this very moment. This is the copy of what the cover looks like for the copies that are going to be on the stands, but there are variants involved. Uh, Peach Momoko just sent hers in today. Here's the Jim Rugg by way of Rob Liefeld variant for that uh, that issue. It's going to be coming out on a monthly basis, Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit. Uh, there are two volumes of trade paperbacks of Red Room out there, four volumes Hip Hop Family Tree, three volumes X-Men Grand Design and WYSIWYG. Uh, your support of our work makes these videos uh, possible on a regular basis. But Jimmy, tell the people how else they could uh, support the channel. Subscribe to the Cartoonist KFAB newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist KFAB t-shirts, merchandise, hats, uh, mugs, stickers, all kinds of good stuff at our spread shop. That link is also under this video. Another great way to support the Cartoonist KFAB channel. Given those marching orders will be on our way. Make more comics.